So my first question is, as you are working with adults, children, adolescents and forensic cases right now, what are the main challenges that you are currently experiencing? It's both in terms of clinical work and I also do a lot of teaching and mm. I think doing things like this is a challenge to me. I've never done it before in my life. I've always avoided doing telephone and Skype or any kind of visual forms of communicating because I really like face-to-face -face contact where I'm aware of somebody's whole body state and there's things that I think are quite subtle that we don't get in um face-to-face -face contact which is um we, which we don't get without without direct physical contact which is probably subtle things like smell actually things that you don't quite know you're getting but make quite a big difference and subtle movements and those sorts of things but basically i think the the main the main main challenge at the moment is the, the levels of extraordinary levels of appropriate anxiety both in colleagues and in myself and in people around and in my clients. And it's obviously very different working with kids and working with adults. And I haven't done any direct clinical work with any of the children as yet. So that will start. So at the moment it's with, with some young people and with, with adults. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big problems of, that we're facing clinically is that, as you said, Confer is a community and people are, people's emotional health and well-being depends hugely on being part of a community. And social isolation is a really big risk. And not a good, you know, we all know that resilience and well-being, et cetera, gets um, enhanced hugely by being part of a community, by having people, human beings around you. All kinds of, um, I don't know, neurochemicals like oxytocin get released when we're with other people that we like and, and we trust. And we're in a climate where people are shunning each other or isolating from each other for really good appropriate reasons. But those who are most vulnerable are particularly at risk at the moment, I think, mm -hmm. of having symptoms like high levels of anxiety or depressive symptoms or even trauma symptoms or symptoms of being, f of feeling not good enough or very low self-esteem all those things are i'm seeing an increase in those things at some level peculiarly enough there are also some patients who seem calmer than i've, than I've ever seen them so that's uh well, interesting think, thing Maybe yeah i think that is very interesting because i think that a lot of uh people who have experienced sort of ongoing developmental and ongoing trauma are very used to high stress situations so this for them could in some respects be something that they're quite familiar with, a sort of survival response, which is yeah. familiar to something they've experienced in childhood. But at some point there must be a kind of collapse. I think it's both, both that they're familiar with it, mm. but also they feel a bit more normal because everybody's struggling with what they live with most of the time. Exactly. <laughs> they, look, they don't feel quite so different, but also I think you're absolutely right. There's something about, they know this, they know how to they know how to be in a threat state they know how to be in a fear state they know how to be anxious and actually interestingly i think some of them were more like in fact they went in two directions some were more like the cuckoo like like the canaries in the coal mine who isolated much more quickly than others and were really really frightened uh, others had were more like more like um head in the sand actually and didn't want to take in the reality of what was going on mm. that's probably true for all of us including psychotherapists but it's quite an interesting distinction yeah yeah i think so i mean certainly from what i've observed not clinically but but um sort of out and about those that are are making huge efforts to be socially distanced two meters apart and those who just are not are still meeting in groups and out in the yeah. parks and stuff absolutely and, um it's it's hard to understand why there would be such different responses but um, reading through your blog post, uh, the good, the bad and the scared, keeping compassion alive amidst COVID-19, panic herds and social isolation that we will share through our website. Um, it, I, I was thinking about, um, you know, these paranoid schizoid states that yeah. are sort of, you know, neurologically pre-programmed. I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. But I think because it's been shifting so dramatically fast, people have, haven't taken in the reality of the situation. It's shifted. 
people who, tra- who come from a background of stress and trauma, developmental trauma particularly, they struggle with change. They struggle with the unexpected. They want things to be the same. And sh- I know we're working with any of the kids we work with, that those who come from those kinds of backgrounds, if there's a little shift, like, I don't know, a change of a supply teacher or a supply teacher or a slight shift in their routine in school, that's when they get chaotic or they get very rigid. Mm-hmm. And so if you're working with a very vulnerable client group, then, then you see more of that, I think. Neurochemically, and basically, we all need a threat system. We, it, it, like all the trauma therapists have been saying for years now, our threat and fear system is utterly appropriate as a way of keeping us safe. It's um, we have a negativity bias. We expect difficulty. We expect you know we expect danger and we react to it. And but we also evolve to calm down and come back to normal quite quickly. And the kind of client group that most of us are working with aren't like that. They don't really know safeness and they don't really know um, what it feels like to have a sense of genuinely deep well-being and those sorts of things so this is their normal as we said but in a way i think there's a kind of exacerbated variant of this that we're seeing at the moment some of our clients of course are incredibly sensitive to the therapist's state of mind and if we are anxious they are like barometers some are completely impervious <laughs> very very thick skin but some are incredibly um thin-skinned and absolutely feel they're we like to think of ourselves as barometers or sound boards for our clients, patients, but actually they nearly always are of us as well. Mm-hmm. And they pick up our levels of anxiety and that's reflected in their postures. That's reflected in how they think and how they feel. And that will increase their levels of anxiety. I think. Mm-hmm. I think so. And I think that it's very interesting because most psychotherapists are older by the nature of this profession. Yeah. Including so, me. Well, but and 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 a lot older. I mean, there's a lot, a lot older, of yeah. therapists yeah. in their late seventies and early eighties that are that Absolutely. are working and, and very active and very fit and healthy. But they're definitely in this, you know, high yeah. risk older demographic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I wonder how what happens between the uh, the therapeutic dyad when you know there is vulnerability. There is now vulnerability in the therapist. And, and it has to be acknowledged. Yeah. It has to be acknowledged. And I think if it isn't, then we're not being truthful. And that will, that will, make, that will take its place within the therapeutic sessions. Mm. I think Winnicott knew about this. You know, when he was vulnerable and had very serious heart problems, he would talk about the fact that he might die. That, and some people felt that was burdensome to the patient. But I think he did it. If you read how he did it, he did it in such a way that he was making it clear that he was a vulnerable human being as well. And he was sort of preparing people. I also think there's something about, so one of the big technical challenges, which is maybe tougher for people psychologically trained, is can we allow our patients, our clients, to offer us some concern and some, you know, ch- checking in with how we are? And can we accept that without batting it back as a kind of, in, in terms of a, making a transference interpretation mm-hmm. or having to blank a screen and those sorts of things. Because actually, as, ha- as the great Harold Searles often used to talk about, patients need, and everyone needs, to have a chance to look after the other. And that's a growth inducing process in itself, as long as we don't do it in such a way that they really feel they are genuinely looking after us in too, too burdensome way. But those little moments, mm. often all people need. I think we have to accept genuine concern, especially if we were in the more vulnerable age group and it's probably quite clear to our clients if we are in the vulnerable age group or not if we've got some obvious health concerns breathing difficulties over you know slightly overweight whatever it is they will pick it up and yeah. i think we have to accept their concern in a genuine heartfelt way in a way yeah absolutely and to acknowledge one's own fear and yeah. uh, to work with that but i think i mean i suppose i was going to say particularly for clients who've had parents who were quite vulnerable themselves and that they you know this sort of going on being was was not really experienced yeah yeah but perhaps you can be that really much- careful with those yeah. kinds yeah you see so any any hint of you burdening them with your issues and being narcissistic and not not being with them they will pick that up like a shot but i think i think you know i think we can spot that and yeah. we should be alert to that and we can work with it but so there's danger in either direction and the great thing about being a psychotherapist like anything in life is that you make mistakes you screw it up and you recover from it 
because you see the signs if you read the patient's clients well enough. And it's quite clear, even if it's a flicker of the eye or a slight tensing of the body or something, Mm. when we say something which doesn't go down very well or we're acting in a way that doesn't go down very well and that's our chance to repair and that's in a way it's ruptures and repairs mismatches and repairs that are the seat at the heart of becoming resilient and emotional growth etc mm. so in fact what you're saying is it's uh it's kind of business as usual but with more to work with in the room in many ways more and less yeah in some ways it's very interesting so look at you now you look at me i've noticed that i've i've, I've got the camera where actually i'm only yeah, very little of me actually showing yeah. um, i've noticed two things clinically which and i realize i need training in this um do i in do do we position ourselves so that you can see the whole body yeah because in a way there's all kinds of bodily clues so what, what, um two people i saw the other day one just from here upwards as well and I could see the tension in his neck and face and those sorts of things but I couldn't um there's things I couldn't read whether there's another client I it was from the waist upwards but I can notice the breathing sh when it got shallow and tense those sorts of things are really important to pay attention to they're really important signs and we need to help them make sense of what that what's going on for them and what might be going on between us through that through those signals so do you position yourself with, with, with a whole body or not and actually the other thing that's very interesting is do you um do you even use video so people are working on the couch are increasingly uh, i i speaking to we're working with the couch more clients are working with the couch you would tend to probably just use the telephone because they don't see you anyway mm. but one of the one of the slightly interesting and threatening but fascinating things about the current where this way of working i realize is that is in a way you've got more permission to look yeah. and to look at than you do generally in, in psychotherapy. I've also heard that those working on the couch are doing this clever idea where they use their iPad or their phone and they FaceTime and then the client puts the uh, device behind them on their you know bedside oh, wow. table or whatever so that the therapist can see their uh, body yeah because obviously if you're on the couch you greet your therapist at the door and you see them yeah and you say goodbye to them absolutely yeah so, and on the phone you don't get that no so i think there are extremely creative ways of doing this yeah i mean i must say i'm a novice so for me and i i i need supervision about some of the practicalities so yeah. one of the things is do you i've decided to set, set up meetings and let people call it call into it and so i'll be waiting rather like you would be in the consulting room rather than me them calling me or you know those sorts of things but it, you know it's all completely new yeah I mean, there's small things in comparison to the bar you know the, the enormity of what's going on out there but there's still interesting technical issues one of the things that i feel that is confronting people at the moment is how to feel part of something to work and feel that you're with other people and other people with you rather than you're isolated at all. so we're living in an increasingly individualistic world the anthropologists distinguish between egocentric and sociocentric cultures and people talk about neoliberal individual competitiveness etc and we as a culture have gone increasingly in that direction maybe following the us trajectory other bits of Europe are a bit, be, bit behind us and hopefully they won't come quite as far but there's something that happens when you're feeling under threat which makes you increase your distrust of others increase your competitiveness mm. and it it can inhibit the ability to sort of join with others and to feel part of a group with a common purpose and I think a big part of what we need to do and I think it's partly some of my work has been in working with institutions and organizations is trying to help ensure that that kind of state of mind can be placed back center stage yeah. so for example what we know is that what we know of course is that when you're feeling threatened and there's danger around then we tend to be much more selfish we tend to be much more aggressive we tend to see people less as other human beings and show less empathy all of those parts of us turn off and on the other hand, this could be an opportunity to turn those parts on again, in a way, by ensuring that we're developing more community focused things. Mm. Um, so, the, so the first extreme might be the kind of, um, sorry, everybody else, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get every toilet roll I can. Yeah, that's definitely. 
yeah, which really interesting isn't happening in other parts of Europe, yeah. which I think is really, really fascinating. But there are alternatives, there's some very interesting, beautiful kind of community activities that are being developed, including sort of um, group mindfulness, group, you know, group meditations, group singing, all kinds of really interesting things. I did a yoga Pilates class online. There's a lot of that going on these days. We're doing yeah. meditations for our students at, at the Tavistock. And so there's a whole range of different things which can still foster community. But I think it might really um, awaken people's awareness of what a desperate plight we might be in psychologically in this country at the moment, anyway, before all this happened. And yeah. yeah. So I think there's opportunities amidst the absolute awfulness that we're seeing, especially in the NHS and especially amongst the more vulnerable population, it's unthinkable when their relatives, etc. Mm. Many people live in a slightly manic world and I've been as guilty of it as anybody. You know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy, kind of response. And the, that kind of dopaminergic stimulated response of whether, whether, it's, whether it's buying online or keeping up with everything or being very, very, very busy. These are all sort of addictive states of the mind, yeah. which can keep you away from what really is important or what you might be feeling underneath that you don't want to feel. And so I think that again, there's genuine opportunities here because actually you can't be that busy. I and mean, we're, we're, we're actually I'm pretty busy, but I'd rather you know there's absolutely no question that there's space to think about things, including what our values are and what kind of world we want to be living in. Mm. At the moment. Well, unless you're a parent, yeah, and then there is very little space. I keep thinking, oh yes, perhaps I'll read that book or do that embroidery, and then I realise I've I've got to do a job and uh, some distance learning, quite a lot of distance learning. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Actually, for parents, it's it's um it's quite a juggle. Very very tough, very very tough, and you can't you know if you're homeschooling, you can um generally when this isn't going on you've got support of other people who are doing it you've got resources all that kind of stuff yeah and the amount of it's no coincidence that Winnicott talked about all those reasons why a, a mother might hate their, their their baby you know it's um yeah it's very very tough 24 hours in stuck in a box yeah. it's not part of our evolutionary heritage at all we're a cooperative breeding species we grew we know we evolved to bring up children in groups we evolved to bring up children in as part of ordinary everyday life with um, support from others all around us all the time. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a real, it could be a real problem for kids, especially as on top of that, I think many kids are feeling that they are, you know, I notice people looking very, um, looking actually quite worried by seeing children running around, for example, mm -hmm. on Hampstead Heath, quite rightly because they, they, they could be carriers of a of this virus without without knowing it and without any intentionality but so i feel in a in a way that because they're seen as dangerous at the moment i think that makes it even more worrying but i think for parents my goodness so obviously the people i feel most sorry for at the moment are the people who are ill and secondly the health workers on the front line and we're hearing horrendous stories coming out of some of the hospitals i don't know how true they all are or i just don't know but um and the shocking state of the nhs mm. and I think parents also really, really, really need support at the moment. So the kind of young people, children and adults I work with, they nearly all had vulnerable, vulnerable parents, which I think is a nice way of putting, at it, putting it, even if they were also abusive and traumatising and um, both fearful and fear-inducing. Mm. But if you're stuck with a child whose vulnerability you can't tolerate, and for example, we know in disorganised attachment, one of the classic features is an inability to tolerate vulnerable feelings, sad feelings, difficult feelings, negative feelings at all in oneself and in one's children, because you know, the, the, those feelings in one's children are triggering of our own feelings. Mm -hmm. So I do worry about what the outcome of this will be for some of these kids who yeah. act for whom actually the best place to be is in school and nursery, mm -hmm. where there's some respite from that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And I'm worried as well about the people that I work with who, I don't know, use a lot of internet things, some legal, some illegal, and are very yeah. dependent on those things. And you desperately want anyway, those people to get outside and meet people and talk to people. 
and not uh, stuck inside with their internet yeah yeah, yeah not just uh, stuck inside with screens and all kinds of things even just the vitamin d <laughs> and yeah. the turning on the dopaminergic circuits and the turning off of the kind of circuits that allow you to rest and feel relaxed and sleep and all those sorts of things mm. they're just those very very basic in a very concrete way but actually it's not going to do them any good and these are people who turn to these forms of addiction like like technology which are forms of addiction whether it's with pornography or whatever when they're feeling more stressed when they're feeling more anxious and i think i think we all turn to our objects of addiction when we're feeling slightly more anxious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even nigella lawson has been reported as eating a huge massive bar of chocolate every night at home and mm -hmm. I think I found myself sort of checking the news too much to start with. And then I found somewhere putting some boundary around it. You know, I'm lucky enough, for example, to have a few friends or support structures. So I can key into those. I can have a Zoom meeting with my bloke's book club or with my colleagues at the Portman or a few good friends who are living out of London. But not the people we work with are often they don't. Often they're incredibly isolated. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if the weekly therapy session is the thing that gets them out of the house once a week, and um, that's 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 pretty crucial, isn't it? Uh, it really is, and often for kids, interestingly, it's the journey to therapy with their parents. That I sometimes think is almost as important as the actual therapy session because they get one to one time, and they get a very different form of, of emotional contact. Yeah. Um, they feel looked after and taken care of. And then of course they're having a very different experience in their therapy. And for adults, of course, very different. I mean, the psychotherapeutic community has got quite a lot on its shoulders at the moment with, with vulnerable patients and how to work online, but wondering how we can support health workers. Oh, uh, so important. If we can't support them, then, I mean, the system is such at such risk of collapse anyway. I think that anything we can offer, it would be really helpful and we have to offer whatever resources free resources that we could that we can offer i think the level of anxiety and then the level of what isabel menzies life described as kind of manic manic type of defenses against emotional truth as in it she was very influenced by Bion as well of course mm. is it's utterly off the scale a few last year i was involved in a project that tavistock consultancy service did with um, a hospital in southwest london and these nurses were like heroes and heroines they were just incredible and we offer them a mixture of classic um so i suppose tavistock work discussion groups and we did some mind we did mindfulness with them as well yeah. and including some psychoeducation and we coached the managers and it was the level of trauma i don't think I, I don't think I think all three of us who were involved in the intervention had never felt quite so overwhelmed by a piece of work in many ways and we thought it wasn't going very well but actually in the end they, they won an NHS retention award um, the trust for putting this into place and it was an extraordinary thing every nurse in the unit was trained in this in the way we were working but then when I think back then they were all completely overwhelmed there weren't enough resources there weren't enough beds people on trolleys all over the place. This was just a slightly worse winter than usual, for example. I really fear that either people retreat or they go into a kind of manic, I can, manic omnipotent, I can do anything. And I think psychoanalysis psych, and psych, other forms of psychotherapy have got an awful lot to offer. Yeah, that. that's what I think. I think, I think you know, when I'm teaching mindfulness, I'm also a mindfulness teacher sometimes, um, we always say, and compassion focused therapy says the same thing you know you have to you have to it's the old um airplane analogy you have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can support anybody else mm. and the temptation for many people in the caring professions and that includes psychotherapists and nurses is to manically be looking after everybody else and not looking after ourselves and that is when burnout happens i think so it's not the oxygen mask, it's the kind of, <laughs> it's, it's the virus protecting mask that people need to be putting on. Mm. But it's about being able to breathe, be, bring down those, inf those inflammatory cytokine levels yeah. and working out what we have to really worry about and what we can't stop worrying about, but, but maybe doesn't need to be worried about quite so much, you know, and working out what the difference is, et cetera. 
it seems to me that that a group intervention would be really really helpful because that's then you get lots of people together teams together for an hour or whatever having support because obviously there aren't enough psychotherapists to support every single health worker out there no they're not um, and in a way the biggest battle early on is to try to get people to realize that support might be helpful and it's a bit like if you go into a school to set up a counseling and therapy service initially they just want to refer all the most difficult kids to, and you say well would you like a group to think about what it's like to teach some of these kids oh no i'm too busy for that but once you start getting those things going what happens is the teachers feel supported they feel relaxed their autonomic nervous system relaxes mm. probably their immune system it gets back online and all kinds of good things are happening and actually what's interesting is they feel more empowered they feel understood but they also feel they can understand where the children are coming from more they feel less judgmental of the kids mm -hmm. they feel less punitive with the kids and actually they refer less kids to therapy because they're feeling better in themselves and i think something similar in a way that's another variant of what beyond talked about in relation to containment and possibly what winnicott talks about in relation to holding is that is that if you feel held in your role then you can look after and support others otherwise it just becomes something that burns you out yeah absolutely and i think there is this idea that you go into therapy uh to really pull things apart and it's you know really difficult and you're going to cry lots and you know but actually therapy yeah. can be about recognizing you know the good aspects and what you're doing well and uh, and rem reminding yourself of that because of this negativity bias absolutely and i think it's one of the things we've learned in the last 10 to 15 years particularly especially when working with trauma is how easy it is to go for the negative and the difficult too quickly yeah. and re-traumatize yeah. but all again and how few people have got enough good internal resources what in psychoanalysis we think of as a good internal object to rely on in order to go out and venture out into these more difficult challenging threatening places yeah. Yeah. and if we can't build the good these good a good in, a sense of a good internal object for example you might mm. want to use that language or whatever language you want to use then you can't safely open up to the difficulty mm. and i think that's true of all therapies whether you're um doing body therapy whether you're doing psychoanalytic psychotherapy in a way we were talking about the frame before that's it's about safeness actually yeah. for safeness within the frame yeah. in terms of mindfulness you have to get into the right posture before you can open up to whatever's going on inside you mm -hmm. otherwise you might just tense up against it and not notice the tensing so it's about that containing a co a more capacious container which can support health workers can support teachers can support ourselves and we have to we have to we owe ourselves as therapists to be looking after ourselves in this respect and it's going to be a challenge if we can't leave the house but i think so for me for example i know that without i don't know a daily mindfulness practice some exercise some yoga you know one of one or two of those things at least each day each day mm. I, actually i'm a worse therapist and yeah. i'm a worse friend i'm a worse partner you know all of those things so yeah, yeah. absolutely and it, i mean it's just an it's the autonomic response isn't it it's just um it's almost like a sliding scale and being aware of where you are on that scale all the yeah. time it's all right the time now. well that's um more challenging for those who are you know working in these um in 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 hospitals right now because probably they're right at the top of that scale yeah i think absolutely and you'll get if they're lucky enough not to get infected by the virus in a way which is very damaging to them they're going to get affected by the states of mind that they're witnessing yeah. and i think some of the lessons that have come out of for example the research on the difference between empathy and compassion is really important and it's also really important for us as psychotherapists that actually depends i mean i wouldn't like i don't always define empathy like this, but if empathy is feeling weird and feeling what the other person is feeling we need that to an extent but if you do that doing that all the time you just burn out yeah whereas if you can offer compassion i really care about what you're thinking and feeling and i wish you better and i hope this doesn't happen and i wish you well but i'm not actually right in your feelings in quite the same way mm -mm -mm. then all the research shows that actually that's much more resilience inducing much less triggering much less trauma inducing yes and it's much less likely to give rise to burnout yeah brilliant well on that note okay uh, i don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to discuss or that you would like to communicate um 
Only what I wrote in the blog, really, which is that there's a real danger that we are suspicious of other people and that there's a peculiar analogy between fear of pathogens and infection and the kind of metaphors that are flying around from the lips of people like Donald Trump about you know this being a foreign virus, a Chinese virus, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think we all notice, as if, if we're still going out, the extent to which we might be slightly shunning people moving away that kind of thing and we i think that that threat response which also has an inflammatory element in terms of the, the kind of inflammatory cytokines that gets gets released are very common and very high levels of those are seen in, in people who've had adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. generally traumatic childhoods and they'll be more threatened but actually we can do our little bit to, even if we do need to keep social distance, we can still smile. We can still look people in the eyes from three meters away. Mm -hmm. We can still say thank you, all, the, all of those sorts of things. I think sometimes it's the little things that make a big difference. Yeah, to sort of consciously overcome the disgust response. If, if you're in the force field of somebody who's showing you disdain or disgust or fear, mm -hmm. then you bloody well know it. And yeah. so think we need to watch our own responses as best we can and as you say there are subliminal that are non-conscious we can't help but show fear but we can we can do a little bit about it i think yeah okay thanks very much yeah thanks very much um...